Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming along to this workshop. So if you were at the, the public talk yesterday, you would have heard a lot about the uh, hate and misinformation and disinformation that's being spread through social media. Um, and the purpose of the workshop today is to look at a practical thing that you can do about this, which is reporting content to platforms in order to deplatform some of those people who are spreading that hate and misinformation. And we're also going to look a little bit at using some other methods like the Broadcasting Standards Authority and the Advertising Standards Authority in the case of um, mm -hmm. content that is um, on television or radio or, or advertising. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit as well about um, talking with friends or family members who have been um, impacted by um, disinformation and, and so forth that they've then started believing themselves. So with the with the public talk yesterday, I put up a, a link to the presentation so that you could go through and look at some of the information I'd linked to there or see the books that have been recommended. Um, today, I've got a link here as well for the presentation um, or a QR code to scan if you want to have a look on the other device. I'd suggest doing that um, to bring up the links in the presentation to some of the things that we're going to look at reporting there. Um, but if you're unable to do that while you're while you're watching the workshop, you can bookmark that and go go to it later. But I'd suggest giving it a go while we're while we're in the workshop, um, just to make sure it all all works. Right. So there's four F's for reporting content: find it, flag it, finish it, and friends. So find it, obviously finding the content, flagging it as doing the report finish it, making sure the report is all completed, and friends is then encouraging others to, to report the content. You can skip that step, but it's helpful to have more reports to get these platforms to act. So to report a post on Facebook, in the right corner of each post are these three dots, you click on those three dots and then you get a menu pop up which has the option find support or report post. It'll give you uh, a list of options and you need to choose the best one. So violence if the post is making a, a violent threat against an individual, uh, harassment if it's targeting an individual for harassment, false information for, for misinformation, and then hate speech if it's a post targeting a group based on race, gender, religion, uh, and so forth. And there's a few other options there, but those are the main ones we'd be using for this sort of purpose. Looking at the false information example, it then asks you what kind of false information. Um, health is one that I've been using a lot lately. Uh, this is the one to use if there's misinformation about COVID-19 or the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, politics is for objectively false statements about politics, for example, a fake quote from a politician. It's not for reporting a political statement that you disagree with, but for one that is objectively false. And then social issue is for those more metapolitical things like false information about, uh, for example, um, attributing an arson attack to Black Lives Matter or something like that. Again, when it's uh, um, objectively false, not just uh, someone expressing an opinion. Right, so if we want to try that with an example here, I'll post this link in the chat too, but it's there if you've got the presentation open, you can follow that link there, which will take you to a Facebook post. So I'll open that one myself here. So this is a post from a reasonably well-known uh, New Zealand-based conspiracy theorist, and he's claiming that the uh, the shot, which he's spelt with a zero there, and it's probably a bit small to see on the on the screen there, but um, he's claimed that the shot is one part of a New Zealand digital prison. And the reason he spelled shot with a zero is that he's referring to the COVID-19 vaccine. He's using 
the word shot instead of vaccine and he's spelling it with a number so that any any AI detection of misinformation is, is likely to miss that because he's deliberately misspelled it, which is why it's important to get these, these practical um, reports done. So if we click on the three dots, find supporter report post, I'm going to go false information, health, and then submit. It gives you the options here then of uh, blocking the person or um, hiding all posts from them. If you're looking for misinformation to report, you don't want to do that um, because then you won't see it. It's more about, um, more if in the case of harassment, you may want to block someone or hide all their posts. But in this sort of case, um, I wouldn't recommend doing that. And then to finish, done. And then if you want to do that last step, you can copy the address of the post um, if it's a post you've seen in your feed rather than one that you've gone to directly, you can click on the date and time that the post was made and that will give you the full URL of the post, which you can then share asking people to, to report. If you do have any questions about that, do, do post them in the chat and I can go over anything there or anyone has. Now YouTube has a, a similar process. Underneath the video, um, above where you see the comments, you've got the options like um, share and save, and then you've got these three dots that if you click on it, will give you a smaller menu with the option there to report the video. You've also got their open transcript, which can actually be quite useful because YouTube will ask you for a timestamp for, for the report. And rather than watching through a whole video, you can open transcript and search for search for keywords in the transcript to find which part of the video has the, the misinformation. Often with these videos, they don't get reported by the people who are watching them because the people who are watching them who may be a sympathetic audience aren't going to uh, report the video. They're going to accept that misinformation. So there's a little bit more can be a little bit more work to find misinformation in these videos, but the open transcript means you can search and not have to watch watch the whole video necessarily. YouTube hasn't actually introduced the option to report content for misinformation. So in situations like this, um, you can use the option of spam or misleading. If it's misleading content, um, you can report it for that. They do have the harassment or bullying for when an individual is being targeted. Um, and hate or abusive content when it's a group being targeted. They also give you this option here of infringes my rights, which you can use in situations where there's defamatory content or private information being shared. So again, I'll, I'll put this uh, put this link in the in the chat there. A uh, question in the chat there: Is it possible to report without signing in? Uh, I think it is on YouTube, on Facebook though, you would need to be, be signed in. Uh, particularly in the case of, if you're reporting something for harassment, it'll ask you, is it you being harassed or is it a friend being harassed? And then if it is if it is a friend, it'll get you to search your Facebook friends to find the person being, being harassed. So um, it is a limitation there of, if it's somebody you don't know, you can't actually report it for harassment. Um, YouTube though, you, you can report that. Right, so in this video here, if you're at the, the talk yesterday, you'd recognize um, Terry Opines. Um, and this is a video he made um, back in August where he is um, uh, stating that there are various politicians uh, masquerading as, as Maori. Um, so click on the three dots, click on report. We can go here, hateful or abusive content. And I would choose uh, promotes hate or violence. And then next. So it'll ask you for, for a timestamp here. For this one, um, I know that it is 11 seconds where he starts talking this and, and it gets, gets you to provide some additional details there. So in this example, 
I would write something like uh, the man in this video is claiming that uh, numerous Maori politicians and leaders are not actually ethnically Maori, um, which is a common racist trope. Um, what he does in this video, if you watch through to the end, he, he shows photographs of, of various Maori leaders and politicians and, and comments on their skin tone and eye colour, claiming that they're not actually not actually Maori and they're predominantly European. And this is a this is a, a trope that wants to where that, that is used to like erase Maori ethnicity by claiming there's no full or real Maori left. Um, I haven't had a lot of success with. Um, this particular kind of racism on YouTube, I think, because uh, the people who are checking these reports aren't necessarily as culturally aware as we might be in Aotearoa about this sort of issue. Um, it's a bit more clear cut when it's um, some of the more like Islamophobic content, um, for example, where uh, obviously globally the Muslim population is a lot bigger and Islamophobia is something that there's a bit more global awareness of than this kind of anti maori racism. But still, nonetheless, I would I would recommend reporting that kind of racism as well. Um, and the more more reports there are, the more likely there will be is that there'll be some action taken there. Actually, one one more thing I'll show you on that one um, is, like I mentioned, the uh, the transcript that you can use there. It's probably a bit. A bit hard to see on uh, on my screen that I'm sharing here, but maybe try this on on your device as well. If you go to open transcript, it'll open here on the right hand side of the window a transcript of the video, uh, unless the uploader of the video has put in their own own subtitles. It'll just be a automatically generated one, so they're not always terribly accurate. Then what you can do is you can Hit Control F or Command F. Anyway, if you if you can get the um, get the transcript there, you can then use Control F or Command F if you're on a on a Mac to um, search the transcript. So you can put a keyword in there. That will highlight each time in the video that he says the word Mari, and then you can look at the time. And you can find the find the bit that you want to report. Oh, great! Just popped up now. <laughs> So when you're when you're doing the last step, the the friends, um, if I'm doing this, I'll often put in the timestamp that people should use and and give a bit of an idea of what to write as well. But I'll say to write more in your own words. So that's reporting directly to platforms. Um, we can also use reports to NetSafe, um, who are a uh, an organisation and. Um, based on keeping people safe online and that includes um, safe from harassment and that sort of thing on um, on social media. NetSafe um, essentially makes reports to the platforms like we've just done but they are um, taken a bit more seriously by the platforms. They'll, they'll be looked at um, by by an actual human rather than just the, the algorithm looking at whether it violates the um, community guidelines, so they're a bit more likely to get uh, to get action if you use if you use NetSafe. Unfortunately, they're more for um, harassment of an individual. So you can go to NetSafe if somebody's made a video about you. If it's more of a broad um, thing like a harassment of a or inciting hatred towards a group, um, NetSafe doesn't necessarily have the same. Um, same ability there but if you're certainly if you're part of that group you can go and make a report and they can uh, work with the platforms there to try and get some resolution on um, on content there so you can submit a report on their website which is netsafe.org.nz um, or you can email them or they even have a, a, a toll-free phone number you can call to speak to them you can also report content to uh, CERT NZ. CERT responds to cybersecurity threats, but they've also been mandated with investigating COVID-19 scams. Uh, so you can email things to covid at ops.cert.gov.nz. And this is for online and offline content. So if you're getting 
um, flyers in the letterbox um, with vaccine misinformation, of which there have been several different organisations producing these. You can photograph it and um, email it to CERT, letting them know um, where in the country you are and, and what date you received it, so that they can investigate investigate further. And there's a link there that um, gives you a bit more information from their website. And of course, there's reporting to police. Um, this is for more extreme cases, such as uh, really credible threats um, or doxing that's uh, releasing private information about someone, such as their home address or their workplace, um, things that could put someone in danger. Um, you can call police on their non-emergency number, which is just 105, um, or you can do a report on 105.police.gov.nz. So this, this isn't something that um, I've used frequently. The, the one time I have called 105 based on seeing something on social media was the example on Facebook that I mentioned in the talk yesterday where uh, the owner of the Facebook page had posted a comment, uh, posted a photograph with the comment, um, if this happens to my daughter, I'm destroying mosque after mosque until they take me out. And then there were a number of other um, comments supportive of that and supportive of that violence underneath and this was just a few months after the Christchurch shooting so um, I wondered if this was something the police wanted to be aware of and, and they were once I once I called them on their non-emergency number there's also the uh, advertising standards authority who have the authority to make decisions about advertisements which include sponsored posts on social media you can make those complaints online via um, asa.co.nz. I've given you an example complaint there, and I couldn't actually find this find this on um, on their website. Um, the link to it went to to a different complaint, but this is one that I made um, about a sponsored post that I saw on Facebook which had a, a link to a YouTube video and the text said that uh, every mosque is a Trojan horse. The, the idea that a mosque was a, a Trojan horse for, for some sort of Islamic invasion of, of New Zealand. And because the person who had made this post had sponsored it, um, it then became an advertisement and it was under the jurisdiction of the Advertising Standards Authority um, to investigate complaints. One um, limitation of the ASA is that they do move quite slowly. Um, they did rule that um, my complaint was valid and that the advertisement should be taken down. But by that time, it had been over a week and it was only running as an ad on Facebook for a week. So practically uh, nothing really happened with that because the, the advertising had already happened and the damage, any damage had been been done. It was more just a, a moral victory getting them to rule that it was um, a, a breach of, of advertising standards. But it's something to be aware of there. Um, in this case, um, it was an individual making the making the advertisement, but certainly if it's an organisation, um, this could be uh, could be more significant for them there. So again, probably a bit hard to read there, but um, there's just an example of of that complaint I mentioned there, where where they ruled that the advertisement was likely to cause serious offence, taking into account generally prevailing community standards. Um, what the what the board that investigated the complaint said was the text every mosque is a Trojan horse is likely to cause hostility as it implied Muslim people were dangerous or had bad intentions towards the people of New Zealand. And of course, with that complaint um, being upheld, there's a there's a precedent there now for any similar advertisements on social media. If you were to complain to the ASA about those, for content that's broadcast on television, not just online. Uh, complaints can be made to the Broadcasting Standards Authority. Uh, more information is on their website, bsa.govt.nz. The BSA actually has um, quite a bit of power. They can impose fines on broadcasters. They can prevent them from running advertising for 24 hours. Um, and they can require them to issue corrections in the case of complaints about, about accuracy. I was hoping that uh, I'd be able to show you an example of a complaint that I've made to the BSA here today, um, but they haven't come out with their final ruling yet, and that's likely to happen sometime in November. But I did make a complaint 
um, about an episode of Talano Asal, which he has on Upland Television, where they had as a guest uh, the conspiracy theorist Damien Dement, uh, the man whose Facebook post we reported earlier. Um, and he said a number of uh, mistruths about COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccine. So I made a complaint to the BSA um, that this was a breach of the accuracy standard because the hosts had not challenged him and it had been misleading to the audience. So I should hear back with their final uh, final statement um, in a few few weeks' time, and we'll find out, I guess, what they're what they're going to do, whether they're going to impose a fine, issue a correction, or, or what else. Can you complain about comments made to in response to a YouTube video? Yes. Um, so you can report a comment to uh, to the platform. If you mouse over that comment, you get those same three dots over on the right that you can then click on and then choose to report. And that'll report it to the platform. You can also um, report the comment to uh, to NetSafe. Like if it's something something harassing you, you can get a screenshot of the comment. And also, um, if you click on I think the time it was made, there you can link a URL directly to the comment and make a complaint to to NetSafe. Yeah, comment there from Kay about um, offensive advertisements um, being withdrawn after complaints to the ASA. So there's an example there with uh, uh, Libra's advertisement for, for tampons that was uh, transphobic. So it shows some of the some of the effect you can have just, just by, by doing a, a formal complaint this way. So summarising here, when it's possible, uh, stopping hate and misinformation at the source is one of the best ways to stop it spread, which is why I advocate for, for deplatforming hate and misinformation. Many of the deplatformed individuals move to uh, alt tech platforms where they have a much smaller reach than they would on, on mainstream platforms. So, to give an example there, uh, Damien Dement, who is still on Facebook, um, has been banned from YouTube. He now um, posts videos on a platform called Rumble and also uses the encrypted messaging app Telegram. Um, but you're less likely to encounter his content unless you download these different apps or go to these different websites and look for it. Whereas when it's on YouTube or Facebook, it could just be put into, into your feed there so that um, you could find it without looking for it. So even though there are still other platforms that these people can go to, they're going to have a smaller reach and it's, it's less likely to reach new people. Uh, question there, uh, can anyone complain about the comments made in a Facebook post? Uh, yes, so similar to similar to YouTube, you can report a comment uh, to the platform. If it violates the community standards, um, they will remove it. Um, and you can also do complaints to, uh, to net, reports to NetSafe for comments. Again, if you get a, a link directly to the comment, which on Facebook you can get if you click on the date and time it was posted, that'll link directly to that comment. And then I would say that uh, deplatforming hate and misinformation is not enough on its own. Uh, Kay's noted there that the complaints about the Libra advertisement weren't just to the ASA, but also directly to the company. Uh, and there was a lot of public pushback on Facebook and other social media. I think that's important to to raise that as well, that it's not just not just those official channels, but a a, uh, a public pushback, which is particularly effective when it is a a, uh, a company like that who are concerned about uh, and having a negative public image. So since deplatforming hate and misinformation is on its own not enough, uh, I want to talk a bit about um, talking to friends and family who have gone down the rabbit hole with uh, conspiracy theories or misinformation. Um, a few perspectives I'll, I'll share here and then maybe we can um, open this up to to a bit more group discussion. Uh, so can people influenced by conspiracy theories and misinformation be brought around to a new perspective? One viewpoint here, um, an article in, published in The Guardian in 2015 by Dexter Thomas um, headlined, don't unfriend your racist Facebook friends, teach them. Um, so he's advocating that rather than creating a, a safe space on social media by unfriending anyone who has a, a racist or a hateful viewpoint, 
um, your best to keep those people in your life. And there's a quote I've put here. There can be no safe spaces for us until all spaces are safe. If we aren't safe in the courtrooms or in the streets, we can't pretend to be safe online. Real life is not a closet that you can tidy up. It's a world in which the girl you used to eat bugs with in kindergarten can grow up to be a frightened xenophobe. I should probably note there that uh, Dexter Thomas, this is a, an African-American writer, and I think addressing a, a predominantly white audience. He's not saying... Um, remain friends with people who are racist towards you, but imploring as, as white audience to uh, not wash their hands of the racism of their friends, but to um, instead engage with them. So there might be some different viewpoints about, about that strategy. There's quite a long quote from uh, David Neewart's book, Red, Pl Red Pill, B Blue Pill, How to Counteract the conspiracy, conspiracy Theories That Are Killing Us. So if you're at the public talk yesterday, I referenced um, an earlier book by David Newart, um, Alt America, The Radical Right in the Age of Trump. This is a more recent book he's done, which is more looking at, um, at conspiracy theories. So I'll read this, this whole quote out. I realize it may be a little hard to read in the, the font size there. The narratives that bind people to conspiracy theories are often large scope mythologies that make them feel heroic as well as part of something bigger. These are normal drives in human beings, but have been twisted by the disinformation to which they've been exposed. These mythologies are also highly personalized and often gut level in nature. This is why there is no immediate large scale solutions to the problem, fixable through mass media or other appeals. So there really is no blue pill, as it were, no universally applicable remedy that would cure people of their conspiracy bred delusions. The only way to actually draw people out of the conspiracist universe and back onto the sometimes murky light of the real world is on a one to one basis, one at a time, very slowly and with an emphasis on empathy, as well as understanding that even the best efforts in these areas often fail. So that's my own emphasis there that I've the bit that I've put in bold. And uh, Newark notes, it's a slow, often painful, and sometimes only sometimes rewarding process. But for people determined to not simply cope with the phenomenon in their lives, but to confront it and overcome it, there really is there is not really any other option. And a comment from Kay there that I think is important: um, unfriending or blocking may be needed, though, if you don't have the energy to deal with their hatred. Staying friends with racists or transphobes is a luxury some people can't afford, and I think that's that's an important perspective as well. Another point here, and this uh, this also comes from uh, David Neewart's book. Uh, he's quoted Professor Newman as the founding director of the International Centre for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence. It's like quitting smoking. People will tell you that it's not possible to quit smoking unless you really want it, unless you are convinced that you want to change your lifestyle. And I think the same is true with extremists or people who are very deep in these weird theories. Unless they themselves have questions that you can leverage and unless they themselves are having doubts, that you can work with, it's basically not possible. So a bit more of a pessimistic view there about um, uh, engaging with people who have um, gone down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories, that there's only only a way to, to bring them out if they have some doubts there and if they themselves have decided they want to get out of that space. So we'll, we'll perhaps open it up there to some some group discussion. Um, Catherine has a good comment there. Um, that it's a privilege to um, be able to to do what, what Kay suggested there um, and that you may need to block um, hateful friends, um, but uh, people of colour can't just block or unfriend the racist system. They don't have that choice, which I think is what um, uh, what the, the columnist in The Guardian was getting at there. Well, if we're all in the... Uh, I'll stop the I'll stop the screen share because that's the that's the end of the slides there, and perhaps we can, rather than just using the chat, we can we can speak on on microphone there if people have comments or questions or discussion points. Hey Byron, I've I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Um, so I teach a, a third year course on citizenship, which is a lot of fun. We talk about a lot of this stuff, but thanks very much for that material about telling them. So that's going to be super useful. I just okay. wondered, because a lot of my students are probably not going to report stuff. And I just wondered, 
so when they see stuff coming through not from i like the, the family and friends stuff I, I would encourage them to, to do exactly what you said there but should they just ignore it? obviously we don't want them to you know board it on but should they ignore it or should they try and counter that stuff that they see must see constantly coming through those feeds should it just be a case mm -hmm. of telling them to go no nah, just just you know send it away or should they do something with it when they see it because i don't think they'll report it it's just mm -hmm. not what 20 and 21 year olds would do yeah yeah it's it's a difficult difficult one whether you should uh, engage with it because it can have the effect of bringing bringing it to the attention of more people if there's a if there's a facebook post that has a lot of comments even if those comments are people arguing that will push it up um into other people's feeds and make it make it look like it's high engagement content which is why you see facebook pages posting these things like name a fish without the letter e because they want to get lots of comments so that the post and then their page gets promoted to more people so it's not always not always helpful to engage with it in, in that space um for that reason and also that uh, the people who are influenced by it may not necessarily be influenced by by a stranger uh, on the internet presenting a, a counter narrative there particularly if it's a page where there's a lot of sympathetic followers and they'll be giving little angry reacts or sad reacts or whatever to the uh, to the comments but I think definitely when it's a, a friend or family member engaging with it there is important because they may in, in that case you're somebody that they know and trust and the and the page owner is, is more of a stranger on the internet so I think I think in that circumstance um, yes but maybe not so much when it's when it's just something that's come across their feed from a, a page no that's great advice thank you awesome thank you there's quite a few community groups who are trying to deal with how to respond to racist commentary on social media and some of the principles also apply to how to deal with say talking to your racist uncle um, and, mm -hmm. and people actually run courses and share resources on this and mm -hmm. some of the key learnings are in a way supporting each other so it's not just one person um, having to deal with it but actually tagging in other friends so that mm -hmm. also being aware of the bystander effect so that if you can just block and ignore people or you can say uh, offer a, a questioning dialogue and like mm -hmm. oh that's not my experience where did you get in this there's a whole sort of series of ways of responding to it but it actually needs people to know where they're coming from first so that if you're dealing mm -hmm. with it in a sort of a class thing having that discussions about like looking at what the messages are on media and then getting some understanding of it before just going in on it and i'll drop into the chat a couple of the links to the resources that action stations mm -hmm. tautoko um program has done because it's got lots of things including a really cool poster and, and stuff like that so like there's a lot of work doing but it's like it's chipping away but it, it's also that thing that if you're the person who is on the end of racist abuse or whatever and you don't see anybody standing up for you you feel really isolated whereas if other mm. people come in and sort of say hey that's not cool you know we don't want to be like that you know it actually is that trying to take away the power from the the, the trolls or the attackers because you won't change them but you can actually have an influence on the bystanders who aren't really involved mm. yeah absolutely yeah and some of that some of that work that action stations done has been been really good i know i think I think as part of that same project they did did some study on like uh comments on on uh, media sites like stuff and, and the herald and so forth measuring the frequency of, of racist comments and and it was i think quite an eye-opener to a lot of people realizing how much of this discourse is happening in the comment section under under mainstream media and that actually i think probably contributed a little bit to the the change that stuff made on their their comment policy I'll, I'll jump in again then i was just when you were talking about the the um you know the uh, official places like netsafe i just wonder what what power do they actually have i because i remember i think yesterday you mentioned that one person every time they had something taken down they opened two more is mm. there does it really have to escalate to that police level before something like you know being banned or you know that sort of action can be taken mm. yeah well well net safe doesn't have um doesn't have themselves the power to to make a platform take down take down content um 
they could possibly probably only do that if it's if it's something that's being classified as objectional material like um like if it was the uh Christchurch shooters manifesto and in a case like that facebook probably would actually take it down automatically before those reports to net safe what uh, what they can do is make a report to the platform that'll be taken a bit more seriously than the uh, report from an individual because it's coming from that more institutional um, place. There, there is a, a term I think that Facebook uses for for these type of reporters because there's equivalents in other countries as well, and so they're more likely to get a response um, when it's net safe. But they don't necessarily have the the power to take take something down. Um, and when, when something's escalated to the police, um, like I said, I'd called the 105 number about the post um, uh, threatening to destroy mosque after mosque until I'm taken out. Um, I'd also reported the post to Facebook, and Facebook in that case took it down and removed the removed the page. Um, but that individual then, yeah, started, started two new pages. Um, the police uh, did speak to him for a couple of hours, um, but they don't really have the power to... Um, stop him from making facebook pages either and i was surprised that they um let him keep his firearms license after after that um that's somewhere an area where they would have had a bit of power um but unless he's uh sharing objectionable material or making sort of credible threats to people um then they can't really do do a lot there i know that um some of the some of new zealand's big misinformation spreaders were arrested at uh, anti-lockdown protests like Billy Tikahika and um, uh, Vinnie Eastwood, and then more recently uh, Brian Tamaki. And in some of their bail conditions, they weren't uh, weren't allowed to post on social media. But the the crime in that case wasn't posting on social media; it was going to these uh, going to these uh, protests in breach of the uh, COVID restrictions. So just posting on on social media and in and of itself the police can't do a lot about though obviously they knew that um this was a a big part of them organizing these protests so when they were arrested for something else that could be part of the bail conditions so in those circumstances um police can do something just that question in the chat there can i talk in more detail about engaging with people down the black hole of conspiracy theory how do you do it and what does empathy mean to you yeah so i i get asked um a lot about uh talking to friends or relatives down that um down that hole um which is why i wanted to include a bit of it about in the in the presentation in the workshop today i think um empathy um really just means um engaging with them in good faith not um not like laughing about what they believe um when i when i do like my video essays there is a bit of humor and i laugh at some of the ideas but when i'm talking with someone one-on-one -on -one, I, I won't be telling them they're stupid or that it's ridiculous i'll i'll more um you know try and show that i do i do care about care about them and that's why i'm engaging with them so I, I do have a small number of people in my life who have kind of gone down that rabbit hole. Um, one of them, um, one of them I was speaking with uh, recently, and whenever I talk to this person, I do so in, in private messaging rather than commenting on their on their Facebook posts. So they'll they'll make a Facebook post, and rather than commenting, "Oh, this is wrong," I'll send them a message saying, "Oh, I think that that." Uh, thing that you posted was was wrong because I saw this other thing, and I've um, this person's quite hesitant about getting a uh, COVID vaccine, um, so I messaged them and said, um, "Have you spoken to your GP about about the vaccine?" Not trying to say that I have a better authority on vaccines than the people she's listening to, but that maybe she should talk to somebody outside of the political sphere who just has that public health interest. Um, and I also talked talk there about how in the United States, um, COVID deaths are higher in counties that uh, voted for Trump compared to counties that voted for Biden, uh, because a lot of uh, Trump voters are um, not getting the vaccine. And so I I showed the this friend of mine that um, Donald Trump has been encouraging his followers to get get the vaccine, and. Um, 
she responded that it's um, it's good good that he's doing that. And I and I think I said something like, yeah, it's it's really you really need to give give Trump credit for for that. And I mean personally, I don't like giving Donald <laughs> saying positive things about Donald Trump, but because because the person I'm engaging with is is somebody who does have a positive view of Donald Trump, finding that finding something like that where I can speak to them rather than just coming at it from this adversarial political perspective, um, I think was quite useful. So that's that's some of my own experience in, in engaging with people. Yeah. Another um, one that I recently experienced on, I think it was LinkedIn, where we started with a really antagonistic position, um, but what made a breakthrough was more getting it back to the personal and sharing the personal experiences and so um, recognizing that they were concerned for their relatives from what they, they had seen and observed but that from my perspective because my aunt had got polio and been paralyzed for the rest of her life as a teenager because she didn't get the vaccination because it wasn't then that was you know like she could relate to my concern over my aunt and I could relate to hers over her friend who'd had a reaction and we found a common ground to be actually be able to talk him through and once we'd got that karma position then I could drop in some of the information that Susie Wiles has shared in really accessible format about how the vaccines are developed what goes into the science but like until we'd actually got to a not angry position to start with we couldn't have a more gentle conversation we had to sort of find some something that we had in common which was concern for other members of our family yeah and I think it can be a similar thing um, with um, even even some of the hateful ideas that people are getting. Um, if you can talk to them about about their concerns about immigration, for example, and and then show that um, people aren't taking their jobs or um, taking their housing, things like that. Um, some of these people may have, you know, legitimate seeming concerns, but but. Um, direct their anger at the wrong group of people and they, they may feel that it's the fault of immigrants that they're um, low paid or that they're not finding not finding a home but if you can engage with them not about their racist attitudes but around those concerns and then talk to them about that issue that can be a way of engaging with people with people there yeah and there's a comment in the chat about um Hindu supremacist and caste privilege, which in a way reminds me of that classic quote, um, to those who have privilege, um, equality looks like oppression. Mm. Uh, and so there are people for whom reaching equality will take away privilege that they feel comfortable and um, that they don't want to lose. And I'm sorry, but that is actually the way of the world that change in the long run benefits people, a bit like the spirit level and, and how inequality makes everybody worse off because there's so much to be done. But some of that change isn't going to, it almost has to be forced onto people, you know, like employers paying um, women equally with men. That is not something they will voluntarily do unless there is actually a really solid economic or legal argument for it. Um, and sometimes it's just, well, I agree that you've got concerns, but the reality is whatever it is, and then moving on to the next step. How do we do this in a way that you can actually manage it? Mm. Yeah, specifically when it's um, uh, Hindu supremacists or, or those with caste privilege, it's, um, it's a shame we don't have uh, Mohan here at this workshop as well, because he'd, he'd probably have some more ideas around that. It's um, you know, it's a it's a culture that, as a as a Pakeha New Zealander, I'm not not familiar enough with to really speak authority authoritatively on on how to engage in those situations. But I think there's probably probably some areas where it overlaps with with what we've been talking about. I'd be be interested to hear some other perspectives on that. From if anyone's got any thoughts on on that specifically, who's here today? No, I, I'd only add, and I just I just read that quote in one of my students' assignments, so I was quite pleased as well. So yeah, so much it's, it's getting into my students, even though we had to spend half the semester on Zoom. Hey, Byron, I'm interested in your the, the concept you introduced the other day about pre-bunking. Are, are we doing mm. enough pre-bunking? I think we're doing enough at COVID 
but all those other things are we doing much in that space could we do more i think more could be done yeah and this is um in the white paper that mohan and i are working on that will launch tomorrow um i'm going to talk a little bit about about this i mean one thing that i think could be quite useful is to see um to see uh some of these uh, marginalized groups are uh, better resourced to produce counter narratives. So um, uh, Tina Nata has written a bit about how uh, Maori have really good reason to be distrustful of, of the state and of the media and, and even of the um, scientific establishment. And she's written about how within Maoridom there is this own, uh, th th there is a infrastructure that can um, respond to misinformation and disinformation and and I guess do some of that pre-bunking work but things like Maori television and um, and iwi radio and and wananga are under resourced so part of challenging some of those um, of those narratives whether that be the covid misinformation which is targeting Maori or whether it's racism targeting Maori the things we get from Hobson's pledge and, and so forth if that um, those that infrastructure for counter narratives was better better resource and i think um you can make a case for that in um in like in the pacifica community as well um in an article i did for david farrier's webworm i spoke to uh, afiso collins who's a city councillor in south auckland and he talked about how a lot of the a lot of the information that the ministry of health has put out has been in english and it's been on uh, Radio New Zealand and TV3, and it's not actually reaching a lot of the Pacifica community. So I think that um, this space there to, um, yeah, resource the people who can do those counter narratives and reach the reach the people who aren't be aren't being uh, aren't being reached by uh, more sort of top down um, government narratives or or, uh, or or large mainstream media narratives. It's also interesting where people start to get ideas. Like most of us on this call would be familiar with the Human Rights Act and prohibited grounds of discrimination and principles there and perhaps and probably the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we may also be familiar with the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act and what's in that. Um, but over the course of the last few weeks, I've been watching a lot of oral submissions to Parliament on the Conversion Practices um, um, Prohibition Bill, which um, the Christian Network has developed a template for its conservative Christian followers to submit to Parliament. And the majority of them have been quoting um, things about freedom of expression under um, NZ Bora and about human rights and this I would say is documents they've never come across before mm -hmm. and even if they're trying to use those ideas to back up their um, protection of their traditional parental rights which are not actually in those those documents somebody has introduced an idea to them that others listening to them might say well what are those documents what are those rights what rights do we have so however you get the ideas to people being able to give that discussion about did you know there is such a thing as a universal declaration of human rights and what does it mean for you and your community you know those types of things even coming from you know different backgrounds um it's quite a useful discussion So the comment there, um, online hate activities against the community who cannot report by themselves. Uh, for example, the Rohingya people in Myanmar. So I think that's a, that's a good example because there's, um, there's been a lot that's been said about Facebook's role in um, facilitating hate against, uh, against the Rohingya people. And I think um, as with all this, this misinformation, stopping it at the sources is, is um, the best method there and yeah if, if people uh, people who are being targeted by that hate can't can't report it um, themselves I mean that's something that um, that others could do um, I think in that, in that case it'd probably be difficult for those of us in Aotearoa because a lot of that content's likely to be in a different language that, that we don't speak I think um, there's also a role for um, uh, journalists journalists and uh, and human rights organizations to be doing those doing those counter narratives there when there is um is a, an, a hateful ideology being um uh being perpetrated in um in somewhere like myanmar or, or another country there and and part of that part of that role for for those groups um journalists and human rights groups that would be holding to account the 
uh, mostly American social media platforms that allow it, that are allowing this, um, and that are not uh, not doing something about it there. I don't so much have any thoughts on that specifically, but one thing I wanted to ask you, Byron, is, and hopefully this isn't sort of too nosy, but you know, how much of your day do you spend doing this sort of mahi reporting and going through content and and, and those things? Um, I can it, yeah, it it, var it varies a bit. Um, we're we're just going through content and um, and reporting. Um, sometimes I'll just do it if I've got a, a quiet moment, like if I'm on a bus or something. I'll be be scrolling through, so I don't really think of it as as committing a lot of time to it. When I'm doing um, when I'm doing um, research for uh, the videos I do or articles, then, then I'll spend a bit more time to it. I might might go and uh, spend ha half the day in the library on my laptop, um, pulling things together and, and doing doing some research there. Just one um, little thing that I, I dropped in a suggestion about finding allies, because there are both organisations and um, individuals who have got links to different parts. So um, the Council of um, Trade Unions Te Kawaika Mahi um, has for many years been supporting a charitable trust union aid, which has had run projects with um, refugees from Burma, Myanmar, um, based in Thailand, but having links back to that country. And so they've got a network of people who um, have got information and sort of languages and there's lots of others that's the thing is that within Aotearoa New Zealand there are so many networks and so many people with great connections but it sometimes takes that I mean I t if I if I need to know something sometimes I just yell out on Twitter and ask can anyone put me in touch with somebody and you know by word of mouth you know there is that two degrees of separation often I can find somebody to give me either the information or the who would be a good person to talk with about this thing it doesn't always change decision making but it can help get better informed and who needs to be involved in a conversation you know those types of things and I think inclusive um, Aotearoa collective which is um, led by Injun Raman they they're also trying to build up networks of people who can be supporting um, this type of thing now their focus is more within um, Aotearoa but again if you need to know, you keep on asking until you find the right person. Yeah, I think what's what's quite valuable is having those networks where um, you can draw on if somebody has a particular skill or particular expertise, whether that might be, you know, speaking the language where, where some of this is happening or being more familiar with the cultural context, um, being able to, to share skills. In, in that regard, and um, and share the share the work around for so that people are playing to their strengths, is is quite good. I find it interesting. Then, Byron, that, is there no proactive sort of all those government agencies and the net safes of this world? They all react when something. We've got nothing, and it's sort of Catherine's question sparked it. So you're out there doing a lot of work to try and sort of you know see what's going on. Is is that is that the sort of the first line of defense we have at the moment there isn't a because i'm just i don't know what's in your white paper but an investment in an organization that actually was proactive it sounds to me that that would be a sensible a sensible thing to have running mm. yeah I, th I think a lot of what we have now is yeah reactive rather than proactive and that um i think reflects a lot of a lot of the institutions we have not really uh not really haven't caught up with the social media uh, media era, like I, I talk about doing the ASA complaint, um, and then once they would ruled on the complaint, the advertisement had already stopped running because it was just a one week long sponsored Facebook post. So even when when you have an organisation that can react, they often react quite slowly. Um, or in the case of the uh, Broadcasting Standards Authority complaint that I've got um, going on at the moment, that's a complaint about a uh, an episode of the show that aired in uh, in June. And it's taken this long because the broadcaster has 20 working days to respond and then um bsa has another 20 working days to deliberate and and um and, and there's a bit of back and forth there whereas that episode it didn't just air on television it was uploaded to facebook and gets shared around and and um 
when the complaint, um, regardless of what the ruling is, a lot of damage would have already been done by uh, by this, and and that uh, that pre bunking that we've been talking about, there's there's not a lot, um, a not a, not a lot of that happening. There's a little bit of it happening in in, um, in some media, but a lot a lot of uh, media responses are still quite reactive. Like there was a News Hub article uh, debunking all the claims in the Voices for Freedom pamphlet, which um, is useful if you're the kind of person who um, will listen to the the scientists debunking the claims. But if you're someone who the first time you encountered that misinformation was getting the pamphlet, you're probably not going to go out looking for a debunking. It would be better if people had had the uh, the correct information first and were aware of the misinformation that's being spread, but no knew that it was misinformation. So yeah, and that, it's interesting. That, uh, can be done. It's interesting with those um, pamphlets that were appearing as paper forms that um, the government said if you receive them please report it to CERT which is the Computer Emergency Response Task Force which actually deals with online um, cyber security threats and the rest. So this is one of the, the things that there is a jigsaw puzzle of government agency responses that there is a team led by Department of Internal Affairs and with tag in from justice and enforcement agencies like um, police looking at what the regulatory regime is like, whether it's adequate and is looking for a review to do legislation changes. And this is like following on from the Christchurch call in response to the um, the videos of the, the attacks that was shared. And that, you know, is partly outward looking of what could they get um, Facebook and other big giants to agree to. But like, it's actually quite complex and personally I'm not sure that there is enough community input into it but they are having those discussions. The thing is of course it takes so long to catch up with the reality we're living in now mm -hmm. so that you know you know my thing of trying to support people who are attacked trying to sort of influence um, bystanders to be more sympathetic you know those are sort of steps that individuals can take but trying to get action across groups will require a lot of group activity so um, I'm not sure whether the, the Department of Internal Affairs have gone live with their consultation exercise or whether they're just doing agency discussions to get it to that white paper stage but you know it's happening so the comment from Laura there how do many people start dismissing government universities mainstream media um, big pharma mainstream health providers seems like there's nothing much less they only listen to fringe voices uh, almost like the more they do platform the more validity they gain in the eyes of conspiracy theorists so hard yeah and that's that's definitely definitely a thing once a, once a person gets gets that far down the rabbit hole that they're not going to trust any any mainstream source um, they may see the deplatforming as um, being um, validation of what these people are saying it must be true because they're being censored um, which is why I think um, it's important to um, have that information have that misinformation deplatformed before it reaches a wide audience because what I've seen when uh, some of these people have been deplatformed and they move from uh, YouTube or Facebook to Telegram, some of their audience follows them, but they they get a much smaller reach. So it makes a makes an impact on the the spread of that misinformation, but it's not completely stopping um, stopping it because there are some people who have already become really committed, and then getting those people out out of that space, I think, is is more the the one on one empathetic conversations that we've talked about which is yeah it is more difficult and takes a lot more more work than than deplatforming but the deplatforming on its own can only be one part of that process it, it also kind of says too that that comment's really interesting that um potentially having one like a, a, a government type agency debunking is probably going to be not effective because that's part of exactly what you're saying the voices that you're not so a bit like we, we talk about reaching out to the COVID communities by using the people that are in those communities maybe mm. that that the sort of distributive model where you know people who who trust other people have those pre-bunking so that would but it's very hard to implement but yeah i think that mm. makes sense mm. yeah 
people like yourself, Byron, who who you know who don't look like you. If you were in a suit and tie, you know, I, I can see that you know it's just a different look, a different feel. Then mm. you know, if I put you in front of my students, they would empathise immediately and go, "Yes, you know, we get mm. this." So, yeah, it's a it's, it was interesting comment. Mm. Yeah, I think some of those people spreading spreading misinformation and, and hate ha haven't really known how to react to some of what I'm doing because I'm I'm not part of the the mainstream media. Or, although I I did have an article published in, in newsroom recently, so maybe now they'll decide that I am part of the mainstream media or, or whatever. But they um yeah, I, I hope that some of what I'm doing perhaps reaches people who who maybe are a little bit critical of. Um, of the mainstream media or of um, or of the state, um, I, gu I guess um, yeah. There, there's other people as well that that might be um, if if they were resourced to be doing that pre-bunking stuff, um, could potentially reach reach an audience that's not being reached by, by those more mainstream sources. Yeah, I, I think that could be. That yeah, sounds like that. Way, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's yeah. I mean, a lot of it does come down to resourcing and time. I mean, it's, it, it takes time. And if there's a lot of people on one side promoting a lot of stuff, then, you know, you've got to have something that's going to be equivalent on the other side. Otherwise, you know, you it does feel like there's a tidal wave of that stuff coming in and there's the odd person on the beach trying to stop it. But it's, it's just mm. going to walk past us unless we, you know, we do things, you know, seriously. So Yeah. And yeah. um, there's a... Um, there's a quote from Jonathan Swift that I used in a, in a video essay, and I think I've quoted it in the white paper here as well. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, Falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it, so that when men come to be dece undeceived, it's too late. The jest is over and the tale has had its effect. So this idea that um, misinformation spreads very quickly and trying to uh, debunk it or um, provide that counter narrative afterwards is a much slower process and, and the damage has been done there, which yeah comes back to the whole pre-bunking idea there. I've put into the chat um, um, an extract from an event that's already happened, um, but it's interesting for the context of Department of Internal Affairs hold starting to hold hui with different groups talking about their review of how to regulate online content harm and also looking at other forms of harm so the intention is to be talking with different groups but at the moment most people wouldn't have heard of it because obviously five million people within Aotearoa New Zealand all of whom will have an opinion so mm -hmm. it's that thing of like what are the key ideas that need to be done before drafting up some kind of and it links up with the the hate speech work and and all the rest of it so I think um, it's really important we keep raising these things but I don't think it's that the government is not aware it's just I think there are different parts of it who either throw their hands up it's too hard or if they're not personally impacted, don't see it as the same urgency as somebody who is facing um, really negative stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, some of which turns into violence and which actually denies them the same sort of chance of, of human rights within Aotearoa as, as other people might have. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, it's great to amplify it, but um, always it was right to know that, yes, somebody is looking at it. Mm. Um, well, I guess we've we've been in the uh, been in this workshop for a couple of hours now. Um, we maybe we'll finish up pretty soon. But is, is there anything else people people want to contribute before we do that? You know, I would like to say something on Rohingya people. Mm -hmm. They are the largest stateless community of the world. But I think uh, for the statelessness or their ref refugee status, I think online hate plays a pivotal role. Because mm -hmm. when a state is patronizing the hate against the community, for example, the Rohingya community, then I think it is very difficult to control the online hate activities. I mm -hmm. would like to share an example. You know, Oshin Firuta is called by the international media once by the Time magazine, dubbed him as the Buddhist Osama bin Laden. But he was jailed last year, but the army government who took power at Myanmar in February uh, Oshin Firuta is dirigent by the Myanmar authority. So I think it's very difficult when a state is patronizing the hate against the ethnic community. And Rohingya 
the Fuji are the best example of them, I think. Yeah, de definitely a lot harder to to counter that hate when it's coming from from a state that has that that power and that that authority. Yeah. I have a, um, a, a journalist who comes and speaks to my class who actually went to, to Myanmar and, and he, he was under a tourist visa, but he went out on the back of a motorbike and talking to find out the real story. But of course, he did that once. He was then banned from entering the country. And, um, you know, and, and you can see, and, and one of the points he made to me the last time we had him was that um, COVID has been a, a bit of an opportunity for lots of governments because the attention is focused now so much onto something else that a lot of stuff can happen and that the international media watch is is listening because of the, the problems happening in, in so many countries across the world, which I, it's just a really interesting point. So, yeah, it makes it even harder for, you know, countries like New Zealand to have that impact um, on, 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 on the world today. Catherine said that the link I shared before didn't open, which is probably true. I mean, it's a past event and you have to be able to do a backtrack from it. But there's a more general page on the Department of Internal Affairs um, on their countering violent extremism online work. And that's not exactly the same, but is linked to this review they're doing about the whole regulatory framework. But if you start it as that going to that um, countering violent extremism page and have a look through to see where they're at, then you'll be able to do the um, okay, sign up, ask for, for more information, keep an eye out for opportunities to, to be involved. Um, I'm, I'm partly involved through a couple of other groups I'm a member of, but um, anybody can, but it's just you have to know something exists to be able to say, hey, add me in too. All right, well, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, if, you, if you if you didn't see the uh, the public talk yesterday or the the interview that um, uh, Mohan did with me earlier in the week, I think those are still up on uh, on YouTube and Facebook. They can be be watched, and um, there'll be the launch of the of the white paper tomorrow. So I think there might be something happening for that. So keep keep an eye on the um, on the the event, and um, yeah, we'll. we'll um, carry on it it's um yeah thank you everyone for um giving a couple of hours of your morning to to come along to this i think it's been been really productive and and some good discussion thank you thanks Byron. thank you, thanks, Byron. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.